some of his writing shown below. And in these secret notebooks, he was developing a theory of species formation. It would be a long time before anyone read these theories. Why? Why secret notebooks? Why was he suppressing this? Well, as I told you, that the immutability of species was the doctrine of the time. Darwin at that time was getting tremendous praise and attention from the scientific community in England. He had been shipping these specimens back and the paleontologists were studying the fossils and the ornithologists were studying the birds and the mammologists were studying the mammals. They were having a fantastic time and Darwin was a hero and he was getting all sorts of honors, all sorts of invitations. And he knew that if he let, set forth his ideas, he'd lose all these privileges that he was enjoying. He worried about dishonor to his family, the good Darwin name, if he spoke this heresy. And eventually he also had another reason, which was he married uh, Emma, his, his first cousin, and he was very sensitive to her religious devotion. So he knew he would need more evidence, much more evidence. And so and once he settled down, he set up really one of the most fantastic home natural history stores you could ever imagine. All sorts of experiments going on, all based on his work at home. He became a pigeon breeder. It was a rage at the time in England, and he actually frequented various pubs where pigeon breeders hung out and talked about their secrets. Darwin was mixed very, very well. Five years on board ship with sailors taught him a good amount of social lubrication. So he did very well. And what Darwin understood from the pigeon breeders is that fantastic variety could be derived just with the art of the breeder deciding which animals to breed. And he correctly inferred that all these wild varieties, carrier pigeons and this old Dutch variety and many more that were in England at the time, were all descended from a fairly plain looking wild rock pigeon shown here at the top. And Darwin started to think, well, if the pigeons can be so different, descended from an ancestral stock, why not natural species? And he thinks back to the Galapagos finches, and he learned that the finches that he had collected were actually very different from each other, each a unique species from different islands that had different beak shape that, depend, that affected how, what sort of diet they had, whether they ate nuts or fruits, etc. He thought, well, if, then maybe finches are all descended from some common ancestral stock. And a key idea enters his mind, and this is a page out of one of those secret notebooks. He conceives of the idea that life species are connected as in a family tree, that ancestors give rise to descendant species, a little bit different from each other. And this is this notion of, of, of life as a tree no one had had before. And if that's the right description, he still wanted to understand why. Why would life branch out of the tree? And he was reading a much older essay from 40 years earlier. This is a, a quote from his autobiography in 1838, 15 months after he had started this inquiry upon his return to England. He happened to read for amusement Malthus on populations. Now Malthus had put forth this idea that there would be tremendous competition for resources and that would be an ultimate limit to human growth. Well Darwin said, being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence which everywhere goes on from long continued observation of the habits of animals and plants, it once struck me under these circumstances that favorable variations would tend to be preserved and unfavorable ones to be destroyed. When there's competition, there will be winners and losers. And that process would give him a mechanism that would drive species to be different. So he says, aha, at last I have a theory with itch to work. But no one would hear about this theory for 20 more years. Why? Well, the stakes, must, as I told you, must be very high. He had lots of reasons. He was still a young man. He was only roughly 30 when he had conceived this. He saw that his, his scientific fate would be ruined. So he kept working, and he kept working, and he kept working. But eventually, various events in life intervened that prompted him to go public. Let me tell you about two of those events. Darwin fathered ten children. He was very much a family man. He based all his work at home. He was, because of his illnesses, he had this queasy stomach all the time. He really was a homebody, working all day and among this menagerie of animals, plants, and children. Well, his firstborn daughter, he was very, very, very attached to. Um, Annie Darwin was very, very attached to his father. They had a very sweet relationship. She was a very loving child. But uh, she developed an illness, and despite all the interventions that her mother and father took, she gradually declined, 
and died before Darwin's very eyes. This shattered him. Absolutely shattered him. And now he was a more of a middle-aged man, and he, I think this experience made him think, well, what could be worse than losing his daughter? You know, he was f fearing the repercussions of his scientific work less. And then a few years later, again, as he kept working on this massive development of this species theory, a package arrived in the mail. And it was from a naturalist working in the Malay archipelago, Alfred Russell Wallace. Wallace, Wallace had gone in to the tropics almost a dozen years earlier. He had developed a theory of species formation. And knowing Darwin's eminence as a naturalist, had sent it to Darwin to see for Darwin's approval and for Darwin's recommendation of how to publish it. Oh, goodness. There's Darwin looking at, in short form, his life's work penned by another scientist. So he was afraid he was going to be scooped. It was terrible timing. He had a two-year-old son, Charles Jr., who was dying of scarlet fever at the time. But Darwin's friends, his allies, which included the great geologist Charles Lyell and many others, made sure that both Wallace's theory and Darwin's theory were presented together to the Linnaean Society in 1858. And this was the first public airing of this idea that species change and that natural selection is a force. So that's why we talk about Darwin and Wallace, but Wallace always deferred to Darwin as having done the greater, larger, and more original earlier work on species formation. Wallace was always humble about that. So after the appearance of these papers, Darwin pushed on. And in the next year, working at a feverish pitch, he finally completed his work that everyone is most familiar with, The Origin of Species. It is an amazing book still very readable today. It's a masterpiece of evidence and argument. He not only puts forth all of the evidence he sees from natural history for evolution and for its mechanisms, but he puts forth all the arguments against and dissects that. It's that old thinking from arguing with his father at work. Evidence and argument. These lectures are largely going to focus on two main ideas in The Origin of Species and our understanding today of how evolution works. But Darwin understood that to, to make these new ideas attractive and inspiring to a new generation, he had to do more than just put towards the raw facts. The, the Origin of Species contains all sorts of poetic passages, and he closes with these words. From so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. And I'm going to talk about, after we take a little time for questions, those two main ideas in this book, and eventually how we've learned how that process of endless forms evolving actually occurs. So let's take a little break and open up the room to some questions. Yeah, in the back. Um, did Wallace publish anything else, or did he just kind of fall into not really prevalence? Wallace did not become anywhere near as prominent as Darwin. Wallace published lots and lots of papers. He wrote a great deal, but um, his writings never captured the popular audience that Darwin did. And Darwin's books themselves inspired a lot more writers. So there were more people in the decade following Darwin who took up the pen and wrote their accounts of evolution or their accounts of, of evolution or their accounts of geology inspired by the theories set forth by Darwin. So we really don't have a literature from Wallace to read anywhere near as extensive as from Darwin. Yeah. Okay. Um, how about his family? Like, like you said, he, um, he was afraid of saying something because of what he believed. I don't know what religion, but did his family ever find out when he got into that one book and walked with Wallace? Excellent question. So what about Darwin's family? Darwin was very tender. He was very careful because he and his wife were so close. I mean, they were so close, they played backgammon every night for their entire lives. And Darwin, being somewhat compulsive, kept track of the lifelong score. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> but they had ten children, seven of whom survived to adulthood. They raised this menagerie together. He was always very careful of her feelings. And she, he would let her read these things. Now, in the 